Chapter 6, The Triads. Hi, Bindoi. Oh. Hi, Bindoa. Where do you come from? The slight, sallow-faced youth stared terrified as four members of the famed 14K Triad Gang advanced menacingly toward him. In the gang parlance, they were asked, asking him to which black society he belonged. He could not reply. He was trembling, and his breath came in short gasps. Gong! No talking, then. Not talking, then? Ah Ping, the spokesman, jeered at him and stepped closer until he was at kicking distance. There was no escape. The boy and his tormentors all knew what was coming. He was trapped down on one of the walled city alleys, with the wall behind and the gangsters in front. They taunted him, teasing out his fear, advancing in ghastly slow motion. They were enjoying their captive's terror, his cringing body. The first blow came with amazing speed and ground into the boy's ribs. Chinese boxers are skilled, their movements supple, their kung fu training affects a liveness and economy of action that is precise and lethal. The victim fell to the ground as more blows rained on his stomach, his chest, his groin. He moaned, doubled up in agony, but still he did not speak. So they drove him along the street and kicked him while he crawled and then limped away. He would not be back. He had learned what happened when you walked down enemy territory unprotected. This made the triads feel good. They were secure and superior in their own streets. They controlled what went on and who was allowed through their turf. Before long, I found that the room I had rented for the youth club was right in the middle of the 14K patch. I had just been walking. I had just watched the sickening scene, but I did not yet know how inevitable this beating up was according to triad tradition. Why did you do that? I demanded. Why? What has that boy done to you? I suddenly felt rather unwell. Ah Ping shrugged. Probably nothing, he conceded, but the corners of his mouth turned down disdainfully. He could not identify himself or show his reason for being here, so we got to teach him a lesson. He perhaps fr from our enemies, the Gin King Yu, and we got to let them know who's in power down here. I was learning. H.W.E. Heath, one of the former police chiefs in Hong Kong, wrote in 1960, Triad activities has, have been noted in the official law and police reports of Hong Kong for the past 116 years. For the past 113 years, special ordinances and related legislation have been created in, att in attempts to deal with the problem. The triad societies are still with us. In its earliest phases, the triad society was a Chinese secret society whose members were bound by oath to overthrow the foreign conquerors of their country and restore the ancient rulers ruling house of China, the Ming dynasty. Today, the historical triad society has degenerated into hundreds of separate triad societies, all claim to be part of the triad tradition, but in fact they are mainly criminal gangs who use the name and rituals as covers for their own evil purposes. To join the original Triad Society, it was essential to go through certain rituals. These included learning poems, handshakes and hand signs, and shedding and drinking blood. Sacrifices were laid down. When you entered the Triad Society, you swore to follow your brother forever. He became your Dai Lo, or big brother, and you became his Silo, or little brother, and then you were related forever. If you proved yourself, an aspiring triad would ask you to follow, and you became his big brother. Thus, the triad society was a pyramid of relationships. Inside each gang, there was a complicated hierarchy of ranks and duties. The officers had colorful names like Red Pole, White Paper Fan, and Grass Sandal. At other times, these officers were simply known by their numbers, as 489, 438, 426, and 415. Ordinary, ordinary members were called 49 boys. All over Hong Kong, the triads inspired terror, which made it easier to run, run protection rackets. The walled city was the perfect place for them. They took the fullest advantage of its uncertain sovereignty. Two main gangs operated there, divided geographically by a certain street. There was a tacit understanding between the groups regarding territory and business. The Ging Yu controlled all the heroin dens, both the selling points and the smoking dens. 
They also ran protection rackets and controlled prostitution east of Old Man Street. Far more feared were the Brothers of the 14K, which was a relative newcomer among the traditional triad societies, having been formed in China in 1949. It derived its name from number 14 Po Hua Street, Canton, where it was organized to support the Chinese nationalistic cause. It was reputed to have over 100,000 members worldwide at the time, 60,000 in Hong Kong alone. I understood that it controlled all opium divans, gambling, blue films, child brothels, illegal dog restaurants, and protection rackets on the west side of the city. It was highly decentralized, with each gang, area gang leader looking after his particular patch. However, they could call on each other for help when needed. They all knew the main office bearers and referred to members of the related gangs as cousins. Within a matter of minutes, a triad could call out a dozen bro brothers, and within hours, several hundred could be ready to fight. Whereas the non-triad slipped in and out of the place, praying not to be stopped, those committed to the 14K or the Ging Yu walked abroad only in their own territory. I used to pick my way all over the streets and made a point of learning every exit until I was more familiar with the place than the gangsters themselves, who were necessarily limited to one half of the city. The triads that I knew were certainly criminals, but to some extent they followed the old maxim that there is honor among thieves. In return for absolute obedience, the Dai Lo promised to look after his silo. If the little brother was imprisoned, the big brother made sure that inside prison he got food, drugs, and protection. Not that all triad members took drugs. Drug taking was frowned upon because it lessened their usefulness. In fact, it was our shared concern for the addicts that would later place me at the same tea table as some of the triad bosses. It was no surprise to me that I learned that Christopher was about to be initiated into the 14K. How else could he walk on certain streets if he belonged to no gang? How else could he retaliate when wronged without a group of brothers to fight for him? Christopher had been attending the youth club regularly, but he now carefully avoided me. Every time I tried to approach him, he disappeared into the maze. He had started to gamble and was hanging out with well-known criminals. However, he had a conscience about this, and he did not want to see, let me see what he was doing. There came the day, though, where I trapped him. We met head-on when I was carrying my heavy piano accordion, which was large enough to prevent Christopher from passing me. We were in one of the tiny patches, passages where retreat was impracticable, and he was wedged in, and I asked him to carry the instrument for me to the repair shop. As we walked, I talked to him in my pigeon Cantonese, I asked him, Christopher, who do you think Jesus came into the world for? He did not reply. Was it for the rich or poor people? I continued. That's easy. I know that one. He came for poor people. His school teachers would have been happy. But does he love good or bad people? I probed. Jesus loves good people, Miss Poon. It was a dismal catechism. He was hating this walk, this talk. You're wrong. Luckily, as he was carrying the accordion, I could wave my arms about. It helped fill in the gaps in my vocabulary. Do you know, if Jesus were alive today, he'd be here in the walled city, sitting on the orange boxes, talking to the pimps and the prostitutes down there in the mud. You are not supposed to tell Chinese people that they are wrong because they will lose face. But I was longing for Christopher to understand. This was no time to be playing conventions. That's where he spent a lot of his time, in the streets with the well-known criminals, not waiting in a neat, clean church for the nice guys to turn up. Why did he do that? Christopher asked incredulously. It sounded as if he really wanted to know. Because, I said slowly, that is why he came, not only to save the good people, but to save the bad ones, the lost ones, those who have done wrong. Christopher stopped suddenly. He was clearly overwhelmed by what he had heard. By this time, we had walked out of the walled city, passing the street market where people were hawking everything from plastic slippers to pressed duck. He said he wanted to hear some more, so he left the accordion in the repair shop nearby and found a public bench by the traffic roundabout. I told him the story of Naaman, the army commander afflicted with leprosy, and finished up by saying, It's so simple. All you have to come do is come to Jesus to be washed clean. 
I turned to Christopher to see if he understood. The traffic was roaring past us. People were yelling as they always do in Hong Kong. Another plane came in to land, flying a few feet over our heads as it skimmed the flyover and thundered onto the runway. Christopher heard nothing. He had his eyes shut and he seemed to be talking quietly. He was not talking to me. He was admitting to Jesus how he had failed in his life and was asking him to make him clean. Sitting by the dusty, noisy roadside, he became a Christian. There were many problems in store for Christopher. The next Saturday, he came back to youth club. Bravely, he stood up in front of the others and said that the week before he had not believed in Jesus, but now he knew him. The announcement was first greeted with silence. It was so extraordinary a thing to say. Then came the jeers and taunts. Boys from bad homes did not become Christians. That was for good, educated, middle-class students. He was joking. He was mad. Christopher was not. He, now he refused to carry on with his triad initiation. He already had the book of poems, laws, and ceremonial dialogue to be learned before he could be accepted. He sent it back. To make such a stand was both, both very firm and very courageous. Such a thing had never happened before among these people. His decision was a breakthrough for me, too. Now I knew it was not true about there being a cloud of unbelief over Hong Kong. Jesus was alive in Hong Kong, just as much as in England, and those who looked for him could find him. The change in Christopher was remarkable. He worked so well at his factory that he was promoted to the rank of supervisor. Instead of gambling sessions with the triads, he now spent his time at youth club, and on Sundays, he came to the evening service at the little Oiwa church. As I continued praying in the spirit in private, the results became apparent when more boys like Christopher made decisions to become Christians. We met together for Bible study and prayer every, anywhere, and prayer anywhere we could, in the youth club room, in tea houses, in the streets, or in my home. One day, when we were praying, one of them had a message in tongues. We waited, and then Christopher began to sing the interpretation. Astonishingly, this beautiful song came in English, which he hardly spoke. This is what he sang. O oh God, who saves me in the darkness, give me strength and the power so I can walk in the Holy Spirit. Fight against the devil with the Bible. Talk to the sinners in the world. Make them belong to Christ. Another boy, Bobby, had the same interpretation, but in Chinese. He did not understand Christopher's English song, and so he did not know that, it was, that what he spoke was a confirmation of God's message. Although the Christian group was growing, not all the Walled City boys were so clear about why I was there. Many of them came to the youth club for what they could get out of it. When we went on Sunday or Saturday picnics to camp, or camps, I did not make them pay. I paid for the coach, rubber boats, football boots, roller skates, and even for the picnics. They were not grateful. They considered themselves underprivileged people, and imagining that I had a wealthy organization behind me, they wanted to squeeze me for anything that was going. They regarded this as their right, and they were demanding and aggressive. Such was true of Ah Ping. During the months and years, I got to know Ah Ping very well. He came to the youth club a lot. He was often with us on walks and expeditions. I learned that he had been initiated into the triads when he was only 12, four years before, and that he had already had a great reputation as a fighter for who had started to collect followers, Sai Lo, of his own. One night, when he was hanging around in the street outside, I came to the youth club room feeling very depressed and needing a kind word. He sensed that I was feeling a bit down and said, You'd better go. You'd better leave this place, Poon Sui Jae. You'd better go because no good you working here. It's no good you working here. You should find a nice group of nice students to work with. You find some well-behaved school kids to preach to. They'll make nice Christians. We're no good. We never do what you want us to do. 
I listened without replying. Don't you know why you stay here? You find us school places when, and we don't go to school. You find us houses and then we muck them up. You find us jobs and we lose them. We won't ever change. All we do is take. We take you for every penny you've got and we kick you around. So why do you stick at it? What's the point? Well, I stick around because that's what Jesus did for me, I replied. I didn't want Jesus, but he didn't wait until I wanted him. He didn't wait until I had promised to reform. He didn't wait until I got good. He died for me anyway. He died for me when I hated him, and he never even told me off on the cross. He just said he loved and forgave me. This is the Jesus that came into the world and made dead people rise. This is the Jesus who came into the world and did miracles. This is the Jesus who only ever did good and he died for me. They said he was the Son of God and he loves you too in the same way. Aping did not answer at first. Then he said, it couldn't be. Nobody would ever love us like that. I mean, we... His voice faltered, and then he continued. I mean, we have to rape, and we fight, and we steal, and we stab. Nobody could love us like this. Well, Jesus did. He doesn't love the things you've done, but he loves you. Really, it doesn't make sense, but all the wrong things that you've done, he said, were his. When he died on the cross, Jesus pleaded guilty to, to your crimes. That's really unfair, isn't it? He said that your stealing and your stabbing were his. If you gave him all the bad things you've done, he'd give you a new life and a righteousness. It's sort of like giving him your dirty clothes and getting his clean ones back. Ah Ping was shattered. He could hardly believe that there was a God like that. He sat down there on the stone steps to the street and told Jesus that although he could not understand why he loved him, he was grateful. He asked Jesus to forgive him and change him. Ah Ping was the first gangster from the fully initiated triads to join the Christians. When he was only 14, a young bar girl had offered to support him in return for his protection. He had even sought my advice over it. Now his lifestyle changed dramatically. Each night he brought his brothers to the club room and asked me to tell them about Jesus. More and more known crooks turned up to shake me by the hand or thump my arm muscle. The few remaining straight types, the students, left the club because they felt discriminated against. It must have been the only Christian club in Hong Kong where the good guys felt less welcome than the bad ones. However, I felt that there were dozens of places all over Hong Kong where the nice boys were catered to, so I let them go. It was not for some years that we were able to bring these two groups together and break down the wall of separation between them. Some of my friends in Hong Kong met Ah Ping and invited him to tell his story in church. Be careful, I warned him as we came out of the club room at midnight into the black street. Satan doesn't like people talking about Jesus, so he'll probably have a go at you before Saturday. Go straight home tonight and don't stop along the way. All right, all right, Miss Poon, he said, nodding sweetly. But as soon as I had gone, he exploded. <laughs> the devil. Ha <laughs> ha. What rubbish. I knew these streets. I know these streets like the back of my hand. What? Me worry? And he wandered around instead of going home. As if from nowhere, seven men jumped out of a black alley and attacked him. They were Chu Chow gangsters, big for Chinese and wild fighters. There was no reason for their attack, but that did not stop it from coming. Later, Ah Ping told me, as they came at me, I had two thoughts. First of all, huh, it's all Miss Poon's fault. And then, you're supposed to pray. So he prayed as the wooden bats beat him unconscious into the ground. Didn't do you much good praying, did it? Scoffed one of the club members when he heard the story. Yes, it did, retorted Ah Ping. I'll tell you why. As soon as I began to pray, my father came down the street. And when the Chiu Chow saw him, they ran away. Otherwise, I would have been killed. As it was, Ah Ping was left on the ground with a gash in the, his back and a hole in his throat. His father summoned help from the, his gang brothers of the 14K. They found him and took him to a doctor who gave his professional opinion that Ah Ping's injuries were so bad that he would not be able to walk or speak for at least two weeks. 
Ah Ping's brothers, determined to seek revenge on his behalf. They held a council in their gang pad and discussed tactics. Okay, the Chiu Chows made it seven to one. We will take 50 to attack them. That's reasonable. Then they took long knives and choppers from the secret arms cache and told Ah Ping, Look, we know where one of these Chiu Chows lives. We are going to take him and his family members out of their house one by one and stab them, right? Ah Ping indicated through his injured throat, No, I'm a Christian now and I don't want you to fight back. Then he gathered one or two club members who were believers, found my room and asked them to pray with him. All night long, they prayed for the gang who had attacked him. Ah Ping once told me that the triads were so touchy that they would threaten or even kill over trifles, once he had seen a boy wearing the same shirt as he was, so he fought him. He had come a long way since those days, as well as praying for his enemies. He was also asked, he also asked the other boys to lay hands on him and pray for healing. The next morning he was completely healed, and he could talk clearly. In fact, he spoke in church just two days later. He spoke of the change in his heart, how he had given up stealing, how he had been healed. He also mentioned that he would no longer take the devil lightly. Now he knew that the devil was around. Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers, but gang fights are not easy to stop. This kind of problem was one that the new converts would have to face all too often. I remember one Sunday evening inside Oiwa Church. It was not a day off for most people in the walled city. The fact that you could actually get to church was a sort of source of pride to these marginally more prosperous Chinese folk. As I looked up from the organ keys, I could see some of the teachers from the Oiwa school together with the various hawkers, vegetable sellers, and other traders. They looked to be solid, law-abiding, decent folk, seriously and respectably dressed although most were very poor. The fact that I had troubled about the young tearaways really rather appalled them. This Westerner, they thought, simply doesn't understand how wicked these boys are. They did not like having the boys in church with them, whereas I sat there hoping and praying that some of them would come. All at once, the little door swung open violently, and the boys arrived. The sight of their teddy boy shirts and tight trousers sent a ripple of fear through the congregation, who thought it was a raid by the triads. And this time I too was a little surprised because the boys were in a terrible state. Normally scruffy, this time they were caked with filth and blood, having come straight to church after a terrible fight. Several of the boys had been dull, had dull red abrasions on their faces, one hunched over, limping from a blow to the groin. Their clothes were torn and their eyes were staring. However, they sat down and qu stayed quiet throughout the service. As soon as it was finished, I got up and hurried to find out what had happened. Apparently, they had walked into a trap carefully set for them. As the boys entered the local public lavatory outside the walled city to spruce up for church, a group of youths had leapt out of the cubicles where they had been hiding and sav fat savagely attacked them with bats. Several were badly hurt. I took them out of the walled city, called a taxi, and went off to the hospital with them. That they should come and find me at church after such a terrible fight pleased me very much. Naively, I thought it was wonderful. Praise God, they've come to church, and they've come in here. They haven't gone to their gang leaders. They've come to Christians. I was soon to find out that the rest of the congregation saw the whole incident quite differently. They were outraged that the boys should have dared to invade the church looking and smelling so dead dreadfully. They did not accept that boys like that should become Christians, or could. They expected an inward change to be followed by an outward change into shirts and ties and lace-up shoes, and they were particularly upset that I had allowed the boys to come into church immediately after partaking in violence. The elders were convinced that I was being used by a bunch of unscrupulous rascals, in their experience, no one like that had ever become a Christian. And when I asked that some of the boys who had become Christians could be baptized, their answer was a straight-up no. They told me very firmly that the boys should have a time of testing first. This ban on their baptisms meant that the boys could not partake in the breaking of bread ceremony either. At first, I continued to encourage the boys to come to the church, even though they were clearly not welcome. 
Then one day a wise and older missionary, George Williamson, came to the walled city. He watched what was going on and understood the whole situation immediately. Jackie, he said, why do you make these boys come to church here? There was no escape. I had to give him answers. Well, for two reasons, really, I began rather, rather hesitantly. One reason is very negative. It's because I don't want to be criticized and I don't want everyone to think I'm doing my own thing. George smiled warmly. He knew how the older generation disapproved of women missionaries taking their own initiative. Second, I continued a little more confidently, I think these boys need elder brothers and sisters and need family need the family in, in, of the church. In the same way, the church needs them. It is not healthy for us to simply be a young person's group. I felt that George, with his background, would be sure to agree with me, but he did not. No, Jackie, your boys are not ready yet. You should look at it like this. They are like seedlings that you wouldn't transplant too young because they die. At the moment, the boys can't take the knocks they are getting from the established church. It's too soon to expect them to make allowances for the attitudes of these church people. You can't expect them to have that sort of grace. I felt amazed. He was asking me to go ahead and do my own thing. He continued, Look on them as seedlings. Take them away and care for them. Tend them until they have grown up. Then they will be strong enough to stand and take the knocks. And then you can plant them and they can help the church to grow up. The church in Hong Kong isn't ready for them yet. Therefore, instead of insisting that the new young Christians join the church, I expanded our Bible study group, and we met several times a week and were now open on Sunday mornings. The club room was used more and more and began to be well known among triads even outside the walled city as a splendid place to spend Saturday evenings. We had raucous singing sessions and ping pong. If I insisted on a prayer, most of them would go outside and hoot in friendly fashion in the alley until I had got it over with. Then back in they swarmed. Without Dora Lee, I could have never coped. She had been the head girl at St. Stephen's School and, together with the other students, helped me with a kind of Chinese translation I could not manage, like translating from the Bible. She was an outstanding Christian, for years giving up her most of her weekends in order to help the boys understand Christ. Dora's help was invaluable in other ways. She taught me much about the Chine how Chinese people think and react. The more I understood, the more I realized how English methods for telling the world about Jesus Christ and how to follow him did not work out as practical possibilities on the other side of the world. Worthy members of the Christian Union talk about prayer in terms of getting up early and having a quiet time with God, but this sort of advice was quite impractical for the boys I knew. They often lived in a house with ten other people. It was never quiet, and no one had a bed to himself, let alone a room. They slept in the bed on a rotation system, some working while others rested. The idea of finding a quiet place to study their Bibles and contemplate the Almighty was a joke. But praying in a new language is essentially practical, because they could walk along any noisy Hong Kong street and no one would notice. Many of them could not read. So my suggestions had been workable, had to be workable. This I learned through the sad experience when one of the boys prayed that he desired to follow Jesus. In misguided fervor, I gave him a copy of St. John's Gospel, scripture notes on St. John, and two book booklets entitled, Now You Are a Christian, and The Way Ahead. I did not see him for two years, and I felt hurt con and concerned for his spiritual well-being. When I saw him again, I asked him why he had been avoiding me for so long. He looked embarrassed. I wanted to know Jesus and you gave me a library. I re-examined some of my concepts about studying the Word of God. The early Christians had certainly had no Bibles. They must have learned another way. For those who could read, I suggested they take a few moments from their factory beat benches by retreating to the toilets to read a few verses. Others found they could memorize a few lines. I tried to see all the boys I knew as often as I could, encouraging them to follow Christ's teachings. They did make progress, but there was never enough time to see everyone. My school duties curtailed my time, and my inadequate Chinese meant that I found it pretty difficult to convey spiritual truths. 
I needed more hours to study. Practicing with the boys was not enough when I did not understand the complex structure of the language. As the pressure grew worse, I began to pray about it. Lord, I've got too much to do. I need more time to spend with these boys, and if I can't do this, and I can't do this if I if I have have to spend so much of the day teaching, you have promised to provide our daily bread. Please let me know if you will provide mine without my earning it. Three days later, the phone rang. It was Claire Harding, the friend who had introduced me to the William Willinses. She came straight to the point. Jackie, I wanted you to know that when you leave St. Stephen's, we want to offer you some money. I was staggered. No one knew that I was even considering such a move. But, but hang on a bit, I gasped in reply. Who told you I was leaving St. Stephen's? As it stands at the moment, I'm not. Claire did not hesitate. Yes, I know you aren't leaving right now, but Neil and I have been praying together, and I wanted you to know that if you th were thinking of leaving, we'd like to offer you 200 Hong Kong dollars a month. Well, in any case, if I left, it wouldn't be until July at the earliest, because I must continue teaching until the end of the school year. Claire replied, the money can't be available until July anyway, but I just felt I had to ring you and tell you now. It was mid-November. Her call was a great encouragement. I felt that if God could tell someone who did not know I was even considering leaving my job to offer me a monthly check worth about 33 U.S. dollars, it was nothing for him to provide my whole living. Now, many years later, I realize that this was the point where I decided to live by faith. But at the time, I had never even heard of the phrase, and I would have not found it or, or rather, I would have found it hard to tell anyone about my financial needs. I knew surely that if God wanted me to do this job, he would provide. It never worried me in the slightest as to how he would do it. <laughs>